saying this phrase for a lot of months now that the whole purpose of why we're here, the ultimate purpose of our lives is to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. And I love everything we do as a church. I love coming to the weeks between Mother's Day and Father's Day for our annual missions emphasis where we get to hear from local and global ministry partners and just hear the stories of what's happening locally and around the world in missions, how we're helping reach people here, there, and everywhere in the, with the good news of Jesus. On your way in today, you should have been handed a really great uh, handout this morning. This is our 2023 Missions Go Local, Go Global project guide. Here's, here's just been my heart over the, these last several years is the, the more we can do in missions. And I'm not just talking about fundraising, like fundraising is, is a part of it. But the more we're aware of the things that are going on in global and local missions, the more we're engaging in the story of local and global missions, and the more we participate, man, the, the, the healthiest, when our church is at its healthiest is when we're focusing on other people and not turning around inwards. And so in this guide, here's kind of the way I put this. Here are all the things that we want to be a part of this next year as a church family. In here, you're going to see family ministry. You're going to see ministry to kids. You're going to see urban ministry. You're going to see global missions. You're going to see church planting. You're going to see uh, exciting organizations like Project Rescue and Venture and 30 for Freedom who are uh, changing the lives of people th rescuing from sex trafficking. Like incredible missions partners. These are our friends. These are the people that we get to come alongside and partners we do ministry. And here's my simple ask. Would you just even take a few minutes minutes over these next several weeks. Read about these partnerships. Learn more about them. Google them. Find out the things that they're doing and start praying with them. Like start finding out what they're doing and start learning more and more about what these awesome partners are doing. Because here's what I believe. I believe that we can do more as we partner with local and global missions partners than we can just all on our own. And so the, we're excited about this. Take a look. On the very back here, I've just got a few notes about like maybe you're even new to missions. You don't even know what the story of missions is. Check it out. Want to put this in your hand, something for you to read, something for you to take home and pray over. But I'm so excited today. Last week we had to make a pivot and I shared an important message for our church family. Um, the missionaries that we had scheduled for last week were Sam and Laura Whitwicky. Guess what? They're here today. Um, we had uh, on the schedule a uh, longtime friends of ours, Mike and Mona Shields, were going to be in church preaching today, but Mike had to have emergency surgery on his hand. He had an infection in his hand. So he and Mona are home in Miami recovering. They say hello. They're going to come and join us later on in August. It's going to be an incredible time together. But here's what I believe. Sam and Laura Whitwick, you were meant to be in church here today to share with us and encourage us today. These are friends of ours. We love this family so much. We actually got to first kind of get to know them a little better. It was February of 2020, and then the world shut down, right? And so we got to watch them as they went and uh, went to serve in Paraguay and went to learn language and get to build some relationships. They are now fully career appointed missionaries to Paraguay with Assemblies of God World Missions. They're going to encourage you. They're going to challenge you. They're going to pray for you today. I can't wait for you to meet these incredible people. This is Sam Witwicky, everybody. Give it up for Sam, everybody. Good morning. How are you? Como están? Bye, Chopa. Some of you probably recognize Como están. I heard the, the response, but which is Spanish for how are you, but I didn't think anyone understood Bye, Chopa, which is Guarani for how are you. And these are the two official languages of Paraguay, and we are your missionaries to Paraguay. We're the Wigui family, like Pastor Jim said. I'm Sam, and my wife is Laura, and we have three girls. Elena is 11, Elizabeth is 9, and Joanna is 6. And it's really special to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, this place is special to us. Um, we come as often as our schedule allows. We live uh, just in North St. Paul, not too far. But this has been really special for our girls because they don't, they don't really like going to churches every, different churches every Sunday. But this has been a place where they've been able to come every Wednesday and make friends. And you've been so welcoming to them and you take care of them. Our girls want to be the first ones here on Wednesday. And they don't want to leave. Um, 
But like Pastor Jim said, we just completed a two-year missionary associate term, and we recently received our final approval as career missionaries, and we're preparing, preparing to go back for a three-year term. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're planning to do, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paraguay um, and what we did on our first term. First off, the, mo the most common question we get is, where is Paraguay? It's a small landlocked country sandwiched between Brazil and Argentina. It's often called the heart of South America. It's a population of about 7 million people, and it's about the size of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, it isn't well known. It doesn't draw a lot of tourists, and it's often eclipsed by its larger neighbors. Paraguay has the highest percentage of Catholicism in South America, around 90%. And it's a very cultural Catholicism which means it's the traditions, not necessarily the heart. Many people don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. It's just part of who they are as a culture. So there's a great need for missionaries and growing evangelistic churches. Another thing in Paraguay is secularism, like around the world, is growing. So we went to uh, Paraguay on a two-year term to work with the Child Hope Schools. Child Hope Schools are sponsorship programs that have schools throughout Latin America. I worked, I worked on the maintenance team with a couple guys. Uh, I helped do repairs and construction projects on the four schools there in, the school, uh, in Asuncion. And Laura taught English in the afternoon programs, as well as leading worship and working small groups. And she taught a music club we also did ministry outside of the schools. Laura led a ladies' Bible study, and we got involved in a local church. We helped out with a weekly kids' ministry in one of the slums. But I want to tell you about one of my favorite ministries, barbecue. Yeah. So in all of our training leading up to our term in Paraguay, we learned that our main goals on our first term were to learn the language and culture and make relationships. And the best way to do that is to have people over and share a meal together. And of course, what's the best food you can eat? Barbecue. So as we prepare, prepared to go to Paraguay, I learned that barbecue is a big part of the culture. Um, I didn't really realize how big of a part of that culture it was. Paraguay has its own style of barbecue. It's called asado. And it's a lot of beef and sausages, and it's cooked over a charcoal grill. And it's just such a huge part of the culture that almost every house has a built-in grill. So that's a lot of meat. It is. But you haven't really experienced Paraguayan culture until you've sat around the grill for a few hours, shooting the breeze with the guys, and just wait for the meat to be cooked. So several years ago, I started dabbling with smoking meats. I found a free smoker. I tried making some ribs, some brisket. I bought a new smoker. It kind of became a hobby. Some people say obsession. <laughs> um, so in Paraguay, I also bought a smoker. And it's not very common there. I had to really look for one. And I started making American-style barbecue. And we would have people over. I'm still not good at cooking Paraguayan barbecue. But I would just cook the way I knew how. And it was such an open door for us to build relationships. And we believe that those relationships will be foundational for our next term. Also, as I said earlier, 90% of Paraguayans are Catholic. Many of them will never step foot into an evangelical church. But they will come to someone's home for a barbecue. So today I want to encourage you. When we were planning to go to Paraguay, I knew some of the things we'd be doing, but I didn't know everything we'd be doing. And God took one of the things that I love to do and made it part of our ministry. And God has given every one of you passions and abilities, and God wants to take them and use them in big ways. It doesn't matter what age you are, what stage of life you're in. God wants to use you. What's in your hand? God wants to use it. We get this idea in our head of what ministry can look like and think, it's not for me. But ministry can be so much more when we take what we have and let the Lord use it. Amen. And you don't have to go around the world either. You have a mission field here in the neighborhood, 
your work, your school. I heard someone say, Jesus loves you, have a peanut. <laughs> I say, Jesus loves you, have some barbecue. If you don't know that reference, Pastor Bruce spoke about hope last December, and it was one of the best messages I've ever heard. You need to listen to it. But some of you could say, Jesus loves you, have a peanut, or Jesus loves you, would you like some coffee? Jesus loves you, can I fix your car? Jesus loves you, you need a ride? But we do have to be intentional. Mark 9, 37 says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. We need to use what we have in Jesus' name to reach out and show God's love. So now we're planning to return to Paraguay and work with a small church planting team to use whatever means to see churches planted and people discipled. As career missionaries, our ministry responsibilities will increase and so will our budget. So we're praying for new monthly partners. And if you'd like to talk to us about mission support, come find us afterwards. We'd love to connect with you. Please stop by our table and grab a prayer card or sign up for our newsletter. Thank you so much for having us. It's been special to be here today, and I'm going to pray, and Laura's going to come up. Jesus, we just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that you are working in each of our lives, and you've given each one of us a ministry to do here. Show us your way, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Yes, it is so fun to be here. It's, it's surreal. Um, we truly love this church. Uh, like Pastor Jim said, when we started coming a couple years ago, a few years ago, and coming to some small groups and getting to know people, it has been a blessing ever since. Uh, it's true that it does get, it, it's fun to speak at different churches every week, but it gets a little bit weary being the visitor all the time. So especially for our kids, it is such a blessing to be here, to be home with you today. Um, we love sharing about missions, but even on top of that, our prayer for today is that we would encourage you to hear from the Lord, to know what he's calling you to do in your own mission field. So we pray that the Lord speaks to you today, that you leave this place with increased faith, and that God would move in you and through you. When we itinerated the first time before going to Paraguay, one of the things that we would share is that when we first got the call that we were approved as missionaries, part of me said, yes, and the other half of me said, I changed my mind. And now that we're back, I can say in honesty that those two feelings came in waves the whole time we were there. As first-time missionaries, um, it, was, it, it was a challenge, but we can also say in complete honesty that God's presence and his goodness were there at every turn and met every challenge. Um, it was incredible to be on the receiving end of missions giving. That threw us for a loop. You don't know how much of a blessing it is to get that call or that, that message from someone saying, hey, God is putting us on your heart. We're praying for you. Someone called and said, hey, just wanted to let you know we have Whitwicky Wednesdays in our house, and every, day at, or every Wednesday at dinner we pray for you guys. What they don't know is that those, those messages were timely. There was times where we got other messages like, we've been trying and trying, but COVID has taken a toll on our church and we're closing the doors. Where at the same time, we got a message from a family saying, we just can't shake this feeling that we're supposed to support you. And they happen at the same time. So God's goodness was timely. His blessings were timely. We also got the privilege to experience being the missionary that someone brought something special for us in their suitcase. One of our missionary friends brought us a block of cheddar. <laughs> it may not seem like much, but you guys, cheese does not travel well. She got her hands on this like, uh, self-regulating temperature bag that they use to, to transport human organs <laughs> and put a giant block of Tillamook cheddar in it and brought it to us. We rationed that cheese. We enjoyed it so much. All of our training, 
all of the books I read never prepared me to live without good cheese. <laughs> it's the Minnesota, Minnesotan in me. But I'll say it again in all seriousness, God was good and his blessings were timely. We had a lot of ups and downs as we learned the culture, as we learned how to live in Paraguay. Relocating with, with three little children to South America was not easy. And the worldwide pandemic didn't help. The Assemblies of God does an amazing job training and teaching their missionaries. But the truth is, some things you just can't train for. And some hard seasons you just have to walk through. But there's purpose in those seasons. Amen? They teach us many things that formal training just can't do. I mentioned that um, I read a lot of books beforehand. Well, for two or three years before we went to Paraguay, I was reading every missionary biography I could get my hands on. It was an incredible time, so transformative in my life. My faith and my awe of God just skyrocketed. I read about missionaries who gave their lives, who lived by faith. They saw signs and wonders, lives transformed, miracles of provision. They rescued children. They pioneered ministries and planted churches. They saw nations change as they came to Christ. So needless to say, when it was time for us to go, my faith was totally pumped up. I was like a kid strapped into a roller coaster, ready for the ride. At the same time, during our missions training, it had been drilled into us over and over that our objective for the first term was to learn the language, to learn the culture, and to build relationships. So I was excited to do those things, but I was also going to lead the whole nation to Christ in the books, right? Little did we know that when we arrived in Paraguay, we would be stepping into a season in our life of feeling perpetually inadequate. Neither of us spoke Spanish before we began our missions journey. We did a couple online um, semesters, and then we did one trimester in person at Spanish school, and we felt like we were off to a good start until the plane landed and we heard them speak. Because as Sam shared, not only do they speak Spanish, they have a second national language, their indigenous language, Guarani. And we knew that was a language out in the interior, but what we didn't realize is just how interwoven it is all throughout the country. In fact, most people speak a form of the two called Jopara. Several Paraguayans also told us that they're notorious for being mumblers. <laughs> so that, along with the mask mandate, <laughs> when you're trying to learn language, oh, you guys are so sympathetic, did you hear that? Thank you. <laughs> you can see how that led to a season of disillusionment. Has anyone here ever been disillusioned? Yeah, it's a real, it's a real struggle. It's a heavy thing to walk through. I had this picture in my mind of what I thought it would be like going to be a missionary. I was excited to be a blessing to the ministers that we were going to work with. I was going to make friends and learn about their lives and pour into them and tell them about Jesus. But until you reach a comfortable level in the language, day-to-day -day tasks are a struggle, let alone ministry. Now, here in the States, we had spent years as youth pastors and children's pastors, and we helped my parents with a church plant and served on, on the, the worship team. And so it was really difficult to go from feeling competent in thriving ministries to moving to another country and feeling like a toddler in diapers, just learning how to live. In a lot of ways, it felt like we were stuck on the bench when we just wanted to get out there and play. I was teaching English and working in the sponsorship program in the office, but the areas that I considered my strengths and passions, things like leading small groups or Bible studies or preaching or, or leading worship or even simply making friends, suddenly weren't strengths at all. There were weeks when everything was a struggle, and I can't tell you how many times I felt totally clueless. But like I said, the thing about hard seasons is sometimes you just have to walk through them. And I can guarantee that those seasons always have purpose. 
at, what point, at one point, we were preparing to go to Brazil for what's called a Southern Cone Missions Retreat, where the five southernmost countries of South America, um, all the missionaries from that region were gathering in Brazil. And we were going to sit under the teaching and, and meetings with our area and regional directors. And a couple, a couple um, I think it was two, three days before the retreat, we got a call from our area director saying, hey, Laura, the, the people who were originally going to lead worship for the event um, had something come up. Would you be willing to bring your guitar and help lead worship for the event? Now, I've got to be honest. I was really excited. I was nervous, but I was just also excited because I was finally going to be able to use one of my gifts. And then he told me, there's also a girl from Chile coming, and she's actually going to play your guitar, but you, you can lead worship with her and sing. I thought, okay, that's fine. I don't care. I'm just excited because this will be fun. Um, and maybe some people will be pleasantly surprised when they learn that I can sing. I don't know. So I was looking forward to it. The day came, and the gal and I met, and we ran through the songs and had a chance to practice a couple times, and we felt pretty good about it until we arrived in the conference room. There was, there was no music stand. There was a couple microphones, but only one microphone stand. And so we looked at it and we thought, okay, we're missionaries, we can be flexible. We'll figure this out. So we made a plan that, that uh, I would hold my microphone and then I could hold our music out in front of me. So I was kind of doing this and it seemed like we had it figured out until we plugged in my guitar and the pickup wouldn't work. No one could hear the guitar. So we're trying all the troubleshooting things, and finally the event had to start, and the sound guy did some quick thinking, and he said, okay, here's what we'll do. Um, Laura, you hold the music out, and then just hold your microphone up to the guitar. <laughs> so now, instead of helping to lead worship, and surprising everyone with my mad singing skills, I was trying to be invisible while being a human music stand and a human microphone stand. And that was kind of a humbling moment. I was having a conversation with God in my head. <laughs> and I was saying, God, ever since I got to the mission field, I have been continually emptied of anything and everything that I thought I had to offer. Why am I even here? And I had this image in my mind of a pitcher. And I thought about my life before Paraguay and all the things that led up to us being missionaries and how I felt like a full pitcher, trained and ready, ready to be poured out with so much to offer. And I thought about my life since we came to Paraguay and how bit by bit, my pitcher had just been poured out. I thought I could preach. Nope, not yet. Pour that out. I thought I could lead worship. Bible study. Not yet. Pour that out. How about every day-to-day -day tasks, like driving? Oh, pour that out. They have totally different traffic rules there. How about grocery shopping? Pour that out. I was dealing with feelings of panic every time we went in the grocery store because it was so overwhelming with the different uh, food options and just the foreign environment. So I said, God, everything in me has been poured out, and now I have nothing to give. I'm empty. What more is there? And in that moment, that human microphone stand, music stand moment, God told me there was two more things. He told me that I had put my confidence in my abilities and was making them my identity, and that he was emptying me of pride and self-sufficiency. But he showed me in that moment in all gentleness that he was emptying me so that he could fill me. So life didn't immediately get easier at that moment, but something in my heart began to change. Do you know what happens when you can't communicate well? You begin serving, and that's a good place to be. It's about walking in the footsteps of a servant king. Jesus modeled servanthood in the way he lived 
and in the way he died. If you turn with me to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 13, it's going to be on the screen too. Philippians 2, 5 through 13 says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In verse 12 it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's not about what we can or can't do. It's about obedience and a willing heart to walk in and do and serve in whatever God is leading us to do. In Matthew 20, there's a little bit of a funny situation that we get to see. We get a glimpse at a conversation between Jesus and the mom of two of his disciples. And she's trying to set her boys up to win. So she comes to Jesus, and she asks a favor. And she says, she asks Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can my two sons sit on your right and, and left side? But in Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28, this is how Jesus responds to her. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One more, and this is my favorite example. In John chapter 13, it's this awesome picture. We see Jesus coming in to eat dinner with his disciples. And remember, he's a rabbi. He is respected But he comes in, and the first thing he does is take off his rabbi robes and set them aside to wash the feet of his disciples. Now think of that picture, taking off his rabbi robes, setting aside his authority and his rights in order to wash feet and do what a servant would do. When we learn to lay our lives down, to lay our pride and our self-sufficiency down, and to fully rely on God, It's a reflection of Christ, and others start to notice. On days when you feel empty, when you don't feel like you have what it takes to give, do we believe what 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, when God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my my power is made perfect in weakness. We believe that. We just don't want to be the one with the weakness right? It goes against our grain to embrace weakness. There were times in Paraguay that we had to fight that pride that would see something, and inside us, we'd be saying, oh, I know a better way than that. I have a college degree. We were trained as leaders. You got to set those thoughts aside in order to serve, but we live in a culture that idolizes those up in front. The self-made man, the most beautiful, the fastest, the strongest, the richest, we make them into heroes. But that's not the model of leadership that Jesus set for us. In the body of Christ, we believe that we all have unique gifts from the Lord that come together in his perfect design as the church. So like I said, after that humbling experience at our, at our missions convention, God began to change something in my heart. Instead of looking for places to lead, we were looking for opportunities to serve. And wouldn't you know, then the doors began to open. We got the opportunity to help out with a weekly um, outreach in a community where the poorest of the poor live. 
Sam and I began planning team games to do each week. There's our kids, love those guys. So Paraguay is said to be a rich country full of poor people. It doesn't draw tourists, it doesn't do much in the way of imports or exports. As of 2019, 90% of the nation's wealth is owned by 161 people. So just think about that for a second, that imbalance of wealth. This, along with decades of corrupt government and dictators, has caused Paraguay to have a very high rate of poverty. And it's evident wherever you go. People are doing whatever they can to earn whatever they can just to get by day by day. So it was such an, an eye-opener to go to this kids' ministry and see these kids coming in every week with the weight of the world on their shoulders. Many of them work in the streets all day. They're begging at, win at windows, tapping on windows, or they're washing windshields for a coin or two. They live with such a survival mentality that it didn't take long to realize they don't even know how to play team games. So we were coordinating these games, but it wasn't going well because they would lie and cheat just to get ahead of their own teammates. That survival mentality was so deep in them. So part of our ministry began to be to help them to learn to work together and root for their team. And it was so great to see them begin to smile and act more like kids, to have fun, and to enjoy being part of a team. It might seem like, like a small thing, but it was a big victory because our prayer is that this would also help to pave the way for them to understand that they can belong to something bigger and that they have a place in the family of God. So we'll never forget the day that we were driving and we stopped at, at an intersection at a stoplight and the kids come out from the corners and start tapping on windshields. And all of a sudden, this boy tapped on our windshield, or I mean, sorry, on our car window and started yelling and jumping up and screaming because he realized that he knew us. And if you go back to that last picture of, our, of us in the kids' ministry there, it's the boy in the center there in the red. That was Marcos. He was working in the street that day, but he was so excited and he started jumping up and yelling to his buddies, I know these guys. And what had happened is the, the week before at our weekly ministry, Sam had fixed his bike. And so he was telling all his buddies, this is the guy who fixed my bike. And he was so proud in that moment to know us and to be known. We gave him some snacks and the light turned green. But as we drove off, God spoke to me so strongly as he reminded me every single one of these kids and adults has a name and a story. They're known by God and they are precious to him. And he told me two things. They need to know that and they need to be precious to us too. So every Friday we helped out with the kids ministry in the slum and then around the same time through a series of God-ordained events, somehow I got the opportunity to start a ladies' um, praise and prayer night in the home of one of the top five richest families in Paraguay. And through that, the Lord began changing lives and doing some powerful things in the lives of some very influential people. God has literally been opening doors from the poorest to the richest and everyone in between because he loves them that much and his heart is to reach them. Another ministry that Sam shared a little bit about came from his deep love of smoking meat. We shared about our, our experience about um, feeling disillusioned. Well, around that time, we kind of felt like we hit a wall, and we were just frustrated, and we just took a step back and prayed, all right, God, what do we have? What can we do? And we decided that we would start cooking wonderful meals for people and having as many people over as we could. It's a great way to learn the language and build relationships. So each week, we'd have 5, 10, 20, 30 people over into our home, feed them a great, a great meal, but also pray, God, do whatever you want to do tonight. It created an atmosphere where people would come together and their walls would come down. Sitting around the table, they would open themselves up. And we saw those meals, those fellowship times, turn into Bible study, prayer time, times of worship, 
times of just good, honest conversation where people could be themselves. It was amazing to see how naturally ministry and discipleship happened. It was almost too easy. Sam asked the question, what's in your hand? What are your passions and your hobbies, your gifts? God isn't asking you to be someone you're not. He made you on purpose for a purpose. What's God's favorite ability? Availability. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, though. God wants, he just wants us to be available and have a willing heart so that he can accomplish his work through us. Be available. Remember that we are not self-sufficient, and that's okay. Maybe God doesn't want to use your strengths. Maybe he wants to use your weaknesses. Remember that greatness in God's kingdom is achieved through servanthood. So please pray for us. Pray for us as we head back to Paraguay. Pray for us that we can serve in a way that draws people to the heart of God, to the heart of a servant king. Pray that he gives us boldness to invite everyone that he leads our way into our home and into our lives. Pray for wisdom and safety. Sometimes people talk about Latin America as though it's already reached. But the truth is, many countries, including Paraguay, are very underreached. And even with the believers there, there's a huge need for discipleship. We're asking God to help us raise up a team. Another challenge that they face is that Paraguay is a tough field. It's hot. <laughs> there is spiritual darkness there. We, f we saw that firsthand. We heard lots of times that there were people or missionaries who came for one term or one year and never came back. But it's also a country full of wonderful, humble, kind people who don't have much, but they'll share what they have. They're hungry for more. There are whole communities who have written themselves off as forgotten and have written themselves off from the possibility of ever belonging in society. We saw that. But how many know we serve a God whose heart is to bring them back into community, to give them belonging in the family of God? As we've been seeking God and praying over our next term, he keeps bringing this phrase to mind over our ministry, come to the table. Our focus is going to be discipleship through small groups and hospitality, and as of right now, there's only going to be one other missionary family there, and we're going to join them in church planting. But we're praying that God will stir people's hearts and that they will answer the call to go. We're also asking that God would help us to strengthen the national church there by discipling leaders. We want to help strengthen families to help moms and dads be the best Christians they can be and raise up healthy families in Jesus. Pray that God goes before us, that he prepares hearts and opens doors of opportunity. I'm going to close today, but we just want to sincerely thank you again for letting us be a part of this church family and welcoming us and loving us. Thank you guys for what you're doing here on your mission field. This mission field has its challenges too, but this church shines when you're out loving, just like Pastor Jim shared this morning, outward focused looking at what's in your hand. How can I use it? We love you guys and we pray God's blessing on you. And before we do our, our final questions today, I'm just going to close with prayer. God, we love you and we, we don't take it lightly to be here in your presence. So we just thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. Thank you, God, for how you go before us and behind us. I pray that you would open up our eyes, our spiritual eyes, to see the opportunities all around us. That you would give us courage and boldness to do the things that you have prepared for us to do. The Bible says, before we were even born, you prepared things for us to do. You made us, you made us specifically for these tasks. So help us to walk in obedience and in, in courage. Help us to be bold enough to serve that we would set aside the things that the world says is important and we would focus on you and serve. 
I pray for each person here, God, that you would raise up in them creativity. Lord, you are a creative God. Would you inspire us for what we can do to start changing our neighborhood, changing our family, so that the church of God, your church, can grow. We want to help build the kingdom, God, and it is a privilege to do that with you. So thank you, God, for using us. We pray your blessing on this church and that you would move them forward, that they would go forward in the light of your favor. Thank you, God. We love you so much. In your name, Jesus. Amen.